Lab number nine is entitled Light Activated Exhaust Fan. In this lab we're going to use a light sensitive resistor to sense a smoke filled room and to turn an exhaust fan on. When the room is clear of smoke we'll turn the fan off. The fan is a device that uses a lot of current. We're going to use a relay to switch this fan on and off. But the control circuitry for turning the relay on and off will be a small signal transistor. What's shown here is a transistor with two resistors. And these are some of the specifications of this particular transistor. It's a 2N3904. It has a turn on voltage on the base emitter around 0.65, a saturation voltage here around 0.2, and a gain of about 150. Suppose that we put in a two level input, a high level and a low level that's 10 volts and zero. And suppose that this power supply is also 10 volts. When we apply 10 volts here, I want to saturate the transistor. That would give me a voltage here that's low, around 0.2 volts. When the input's low, we don't have enough voltage to forward bias this junction. We cut off the transistor and no current flows. And so this node voltage is the same as this node voltage. What I want to do now is pick this resistor to make sure that I saturate the transistor. Usually this is part of other circuitry that we don't have much control in picking the values of. We'll later see this is part of an equivalent circuit of a read relay. Okay, the current that's flowing in this resistor is this node voltage minus this node voltage divided by this. So if we had 10 volts and we had a 1K resistor for R sub C and a saturation of 0.2, we're looking at about 9.8 milliamps of collector current. If you recall from the course, to saturate a transistor, we need to keep the ratio of IC to IB less than beta F. You can solve this for I sub B then. It's I sub C divided by beta F. We need to be greater than or equal to that. Well, in this case, we have 9.8 milliamps and a beta F around 150. So we're looking at a base current that needs to be bigger than or equal to 65.3 microamps. What is the base current? Well, it's the current flowing into the base. It's going to be this node voltage minus this node voltage divided by R sub B. So we've got 10 minus 0.65 over R sub B. That needs to be greater than or equal to 65.3 microamps. So we could solve for R sub B. Bring that over here. Bring the 65.3 microamps over here. And we've got this relationship that the resistor needs to be smaller than 143K. Let's pick something dramatically different than that. Then we can pretty much guarantee saturation. I'll just pick a 10K resistor. So again, what's happening here is when the input is high, the transistor saturates. We have a low voltage around 0.2. When the input's low, transistor's cut off, and the output's roughly equal to the power supply. It's called an inverter in logic, and this is typical of any kind of a transistor switching circuit. The relay that we're going to use to control this large current fan consists of a coil of wire, which has some resistance and then some inductance. Let's take a look at some of the unique problems with switching an inductive load, and then we'll put this whole circuit together. When the input's high, suppose it's again 10 volts, we're going to saturate the transistor, and this is going to be around 0.2 volts. In steady state, the inductor looks like a short circuit. And so what I've got here is just uh, this resistance. So again, this voltage minus the saturation voltage divided by this resistance would be the current through the coil. So if this was 10 volts, and this was 0.2, and this was 550 ohms, we'd have about 17.8 milliamps. Now when the input goes low, we cut off the transistor which means the current through it is zero. But if you remember from our course that V is equal to L D I D T, and so if there's an abrupt change in current, there has to be a huge voltage present. So the current's wanting to flow in here, and all of a sudden now we cut off the path. So now that current's flowing into an open circuit. It produce very large voltages as a result. The transistor we're looking at in the course has a family of curves for different values of base current. We have different collector currents. But if we go out farther in voltage, we actually break down the junctions and Eventually, current just flows and destroys the transistor. So in this particular case, we're operating at about 17.8 milliamps when we're saturated. But now when we cut off, the base current goes to zero. And there's actually another line here that the current just jumps onto. This will produce uh, very large voltages. This is really how a spark gap works. You have a coil, and you have some current flowing through it. And you break that contact. And that current wants to flow and breaks down the air. In this case, we're going to break down the transistor. This breakdown voltage is minimally 40 volts, but you might see something as high as 150 volts in lab. So with a 10 volt power supply, I'm able to create huge voltages compared to that power supply. Now I'm getting not, nothing for free here. When I look at the total power, the power out is never more than the power in. But we can get these large voltages like we saw with a transformer. We can step voltage up or step it down. 
But then when you cut off the transistor, the voltage can shoot up to this breakover voltage. Eventually that energy stored in the inductor is dissipated and we come back down to a, just a 10 volts of the power supply. Well, if you keep doing this over and over again on the transistor, you eventually destroy the transistors. What we're going to do is we're going to put in a protection diode called a damping diode. That's a diode between the collector and back into the power supply. So when you saturate the transistor, this becomes 0.2 volts. Current still flows in this direction, but can't flow in this direction. When you cut off the transistor and this becomes an open circuit, the current that's flowing in this coil, again, wants to continue to flow, and now it's got a path for it to flow. So the, the energy is just dissipated in this little loop with a diode in the resistor. What you'll see when this is occurring, that the voltage here now is just going to be one diode drop plus the power supply. So we had 0.6 volts here for a diode drop and 10 volts, had about 10.6 at the output. So the big spike that we just saw will be chopped off in lab. And this will protect the transistor from continual over voltages. There's several types of relays. The one we're going to be using in lab is called a reed relay. It kind of looks like a reed. What it is is two metal rods in a sealed glass tube wrapped with a coil of wire around it. When current flows through the coil, it becomes an electromagnet. So we've got current flowing through here. It creates a magnetic field and literally closes the contacts of those rods. So as an equivalent circuit, what I've got here is some wire. So we've got some resistance of the wire and then some inductance associated with that coiling around the glass tube. The rods themselves look like very low resistance devices or pieces of metal, and so when they are open, they have a, have a very high resistance, and when I create the magnet, I essentially close it. The main advantage of using a relay is that the controlling circuitry that's here is physically isolated from a high energy load. So you'll see things like this in automobiles where you've got a car battery, which is a very low voltage, but has an enormous amount of energy stored in it. Suppose you had a room that was filled with smoke, you turned on a fan and you were able to exhaust that smoke. Eventually the smoke would be gone and like turn the fan off again. What we're going to use is a thing called a cadmium sulfide photocell. This is actually a semiconductor where the conductivity increases with light intensity. For instance, you have a very low resistance when light is shining on this device and when it's covered up or dark, it's a very high resistance. What's interesting about these particular photocells is that they have a response with the wavelengths of light that are very similar to the human eye, have about the same response. So what we see is really what this sensor also sees. This is the electrical symbol for this photocell. It's a resistor dependent on a wavelength of light. These photocells are used in, in all kinds of things that need to respond like a human eye. So autofocus lenses, exposure meters, contrast controls for TVs, dimmer switches for lights, flame detectors, and even street lights are using this type of a photocell. Let's take a look at an application here of how we're going to use that photocell to create a square wave. We have a voltage divider here. The resistance of the photocell divided by the photocell plus 10K multiplied by 10 is the voltage that's present here. Suppose that when I cover this up with my hand in lab or essentially cover it up with smoke, I have a fairly high resistance. Suppose it's around 100K. You'll be measuring these also in lab. Then my voltage divider is going to be 100K over 100K plus 10K times 10, so a number very close to 1 times 10. It actually turns out to be 9.09. When, when light's exposed on this, the resistance goes way down. Suppose it's as low as 100 ohms. Again, you'll measure this in lab. Then you have 100 ohms, or 100 ohms plus 10K, which is roughly 100 divided by 10K times 10. That'd be about a tenth. The actual value is 0 0.099. So we're going to use this as our sensor of being light and dark, and so I could sense uh, some change in light level. In this lab, we're going to take a look at using a bipolar transistor as a switch, look at some of the problems of switching inductive loads, and then go on to put together a circuit that would allow us to turn uh, a fairly large current fan on and off. Some of the concepts we're going to take a look at are the bipolar transistor as a logic inverter, switching resistive and inductive loads, using a damping diode to help discharge a coil, using a relay for a load isolation, a photoresistor uh, as a sensor, and we're going to use a magnet to also activate the circuit. The voltage that we're creating across the output with this switching transistor can get quite high. In fact, it can exceed the rating of the, of the scope's front end. So using a times 10 probe allows us to step the voltage down by a factor of 10. This will protect the input of a oscilloscope from damage. And this is uh, lab number nine, a light-activated exhaust fan.